Last week we learned about spiritual adultery and how friendship with the world makes us an enemy of God. And we saw that our Creator has commanded over and over again that we never worship Him with anything that was ever directly associated with pagan idolatry. Additionally, we learned that God has given us some very special holy days to celebrate to remind us of all that He's done for us, such as the Sabbath, the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost, the Day of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And we also learned that the holidays of the world around us are either forgeries that try to compete with God's holy days to distract us from singularly focusing on our relationship with God, or they're actually spiritual adultery and idolatry because they're based on the worship of pagan false gods from history. So, to test all things as Paul instructed, we learned that we should ask what the origin is of any holiday or tradition before we celebrate it, to see if it's from the world or if it's from God's Word. And today, we'll apply that simple test to the most popular so-called holiday in the modern Christian church. So, based on what we learned last week, we'll be testing each component of the modern celebration of Christmas against the Word of God to discover if Christmas is a man-made forgery, a clear form of spiritual adultery, or a true form of biblical worship. And before we begin to classify Christmas in one of these three groups, we'll need to define what each group means. A man-made forgery, in regards to a holiday, is a special day that's set aside to celebrate or commemorate some event or person, even though that day or time was not prescribed by the Bible. All of God's prescribed holy feast days and Sabbaths specifically celebrate things God has done or things that He will do. But mankind has made many forgeries that don't accurately point to specific activities of God. Man-made forgeries must also not contain any connections to pagan idolatry to qualify as a forgery, because any connection to pagan idolatry would move the holiday into the spiritual adultery category. The danger of a man-made forgery holiday is that it distracts us from the prescribed biblical holy days that were designed by God for our good. And in general, forgery holidays normally cause us to have less of an appreciation for the special appointed feast days of the Lord. But, while a forgery holiday subtly leads us away from a pure devotion to Christ, any holiday that has direct ties to pagan idolatry will actually cause us to commit spiritual adultery against God. So, for a holiday to fall into the spiritual adultery group, it has to contain some specific elements of pagan idolatry. And this is clearly much worse than a man-made forgery holiday. And quite simply, to be a true form of biblical worship, we must be able to find the holy day in question prescribed in the Bible itself. If God instituted the holy day or the feast day and he gave us written instructions on how to celebrate it, then it is a true form of biblical worship and it is plainly approved by God. And each of God's appointed times, called Moedim in the Hebrew, serve as an appointment with God when God will specifically meet with His people in the context of history for a specific purpose. And the Moedim serve to remind us of what God has done, while they also point to what He's going to do in the future. We see very plainly in Scripture that the Sabbath is to be kept holy every seventh day of the week by resting. And we do this because God rested on the seventh day of the creation week. We also see 
that Passover is always on the 14th day of the first biblical month. And on this day, the lamb is to be killed and prepared for the Feast of Unleavened Bread at sundown. Then, at sundown on the 15th day of the first biblical month, the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins, and the lamb is to be consumed with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. Also, on the day after the Sabbath that fell during the Days of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Firstfruits takes place, as the first sheaf of the harvest is waved before the Lord by the priest. And from the Feast of Firstfruits, the count to fifty begins, and the fiftieth day of that count is today known as Pentecost, which means fiftieth. Then, on the first day of the seventh biblical month, the Day of Trumpets is to be celebrated. And on the tenth day of that seventh month, the Day of Atonement is observed by a fast. And the fifteenth day of the seventh month begins the Feast of Tabernacles, which lasts for seven days and ends on the eighth day with a sacred assembly. These clear appointed times with the dates that they should be celebrated on, are plainly laid out in the Word of God. And not only did Jesus and his disciples celebrate them in the New Testament, the prophets are clear that every nation will celebrate certain feasts of the Lord in the Millennial Kingdom. Zechariah prophesies, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that don't come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So, once we realize that we'll be celebrating these biblical days after we're resurrected and reigning with Jesus, we must also note that the Lord did some amazing things on these days in the New Covenant that we celebrate during these very special times. On Passover, Jesus died as the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And he knew this day would be the day of his death, as we can see when he said, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. On unleavened bread, Jesus was placed into the tomb as he endured the bitterness of death as our sinless substitute. On first fruits, Jesus rose from the grave and even presented himself to the Father as the first fruits of the resurrection. And on Pentecost, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to fill his disciples with indescribable power from on high. Now today, as we live in the Pentecost power of the Holy Spirit, we await the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets when Jesus will return. And we solemnly remember that Jesus will cleanse the earth of those who live in rebellion to him as the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. All while we look forward, to the day that Jesus will establish his throne on this earth and dwell with his people forever as the Feast of Tabernacles foreshadows. Clearly, the commanded Moedim of the Lord from Leviticus 23 are the framework of the entire Bible, and that's why God has given them to us, along with the weekly Sabbath that reminds us that our God created all things, including the Sabbath, for all of mankind. So, the very first thing we can say without any hesitation about Christmas is that Christmas is obviously not in this list of biblical holy days. Actually, nowhere in the 66 books 
of Holy Scripture can anyone find a prescription to celebrate a holy day in December associated with the birth of Jesus Christ. So this is our first indication that Christmas is not a true form of biblical worship. The date of Christmas is not a biblical date. The traditions of Christmas are not biblical traditions. The word Christmas is not a biblical word. And the instructions for the celebration of Christmas are nowhere to be found in the Word of God. So, we're left with two basic options. The first and most favorable option is that Christmas is a man-made forgery that's trying to pass off as a true biblical holy day. And the second option is that Christmas is connected to paganism and it is therefore a grotesque form of spiritual adultery. And the determining factor is, of course, does Christmas have any connections with pagan idolatry? 60 minutes on the internet for any individual with a 7th grade education will immediately reveal the answer to that question. But amazingly, even though Paul told every Christian to test all things, very few Christians ever take the time to look for themselves as the Bible commands. Many Christians assume that their pastors and church leaders would never perpetuate any form of false teaching in the church, and surely all their leaders must know whether Christmas has pagan roots or not. But by assuming this, they ignore the biblical principle that Jesus told all of his disciples to beware of false prophets. Peter told all Christians to beware that we're not led astray by the error of the wicked. Paul told all the believers in the Thessalonian church to test all things. And he also told all the disciples in the Colossian church to beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. It's not an accident that the Bereans were called noble-minded by the Holy Spirit. It was precisely because they tested all that Paul said about Jesus by searching the scriptures daily to see if what Paul told them was true. So if scripture applauds those who tested the words of the Apostle Paul, we would do well to follow that example by testing all things by the word of God while never relying on any man's personal credentials. A pastor or a teacher is only as accurate as they are biblically sound. Sadly, every teacher on earth, including me, can stray from the Word of God and get cheated according to philosophy and empty deceit and according to the traditions of men and the basic principles of the world, especially if they're not testing everything against the Word of God. And if you follow a teacher that goes astray, then they will lead you astray along with them. The Pharisees were misled by the traditions of men because they believed in a legendary oral law that went beyond what was written in the scriptures. So Jesus said of them, Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. It is a very dangerous thing to follow a false teacher. And it is a very serious logical fallacy to appeal to an irrelevant authority like a human Bible teacher. We must never forget that even Jesus himself did not appeal to his own divine authority when he was here on the earth. Jesus said, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak.
So please, friends, never trust me or any other teacher or teaching based on the perceived authority of the individual. Only ever trust the authority of the incorruptible Word of God and the commandments of our everlasting Father that His Word contains. Biblically speaking, human education is not a valid source of authority. Non-biblical tradition is not a valid source of authority. Majority opinion is not a valid source of authority. Apostolic succession is not a valid source of authority. And even Jesus himself did not use his own divinity as a source of authority, even though it would have been valid. To provide us all with an example to follow, Jesus defeated the lies of the serpent in the wilderness with the authority of the word of God. And we must rely on the authority of the scriptures to follow in our glorious Lord's footsteps. So we cannot trust popular opinion, education, charisma, tradition, or our own feelings about Christmas. We must trust scripture and scripture alone. And since Scripture does not mention Christmas in terms of a celebration, we can confidently conclude that it is not a true form of biblical worship. And then, we must do the research for ourselves to determine if Christmas is actually pagan in origin. The Encyclopedia of Food and Culture says about Christmas, It also falls three days after the winter solstice a date when a number of pagan gods underwent resurrection after the shortest day of the year. This includes Sol Invictus of the Roman state religion during pagan times, a cult associated with the deification of the emperor. Whatever the explanation, it is evident that the early Christian fathers, in their struggle for political and psychological supremacy, turned to the Interpretatio Romana, the process of Romanizing foreign gods, on its ear by expropriating a number of pagan symbols and observances and providing them with new Christian meanings. For this reason, Christmas, and especially the foods associated with it, represent a fusion of diverse pagan strands, varying widely in emphasis from one country to the next. The Canadian Encyclopedia reports about Christmas. One of these festivals, the Roman solar feast of Natalis Invicti, which refers to the birthday of the Invincible Sun, which was dedicated to the pagan god Sol Invictus, celebrated on December 25th, may have a strong claim as the origin of our late December date for Christmas. Also, in Roman times, Saturnus, the god of seed and sowing, was honored with a festival. The Saturnalia was officially celebrated on the 17th of December and in Cicero's time lasted seven days from the 17th to the 23rd of December. In the Roman calendar, the Saturnalia was designated a holy day on which religious rites were performed. But it was also the most popular holiday of the Roman year, an occasion for visits to friends, for drinking, for the presentation of gifts, particularly wax candles, perhaps to signify the return of light after the solstice. The Saturnalia continued to be celebrated down to the Christian era when, by the middle of the 4th century AD, its festivities had become absorbed in the celebration of Christmas. About the festival of Saturnalia, where many modern Christmas traditions find their origin, timeanddate.com records that human sacrifice, unrestrained behavior, debauchery, and crime were common, and these sinful celebrations were held as far back as 217 BC. And other historical sources indicate that public nudity, sexual promiscuity, and rampant drunkenness were common also. And still, with that background, the New World Encyclopedia says of Christmas, 
Many Christmas traditions have their origins in pagan winter celebrations. Examples of winter festivals that have influenced Christmas include the pre-Christian festivals of Yule and Roman Saturnalia. And they added, Christmas came to be celebrated on the Roman holiday of Saturnalia, and it was from the pagan holiday that many of the customs of Christmas had their roots. The celebrations of Saturnalia included the making and giving of small presents. This holiday was observed over a series of days beginning on December the 17th, the birthday of Saturn, and ending on December 25th, the birthday of Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun. The combined festivals resulted in an extended winter holiday season. Business was postponed and even slaves feasted. There was drinking, gambling, and singing, and nudity was relatively common. Encyclopedia Britannica states, The actual observance of the day of Jesus' birth was long in coming. In particular, during the first two centuries of Christianity, there was a strong opposition to recognizing birthdays of martyrs, or, for that matter, of Jesus. And it was not until December 25th in the year 336 A.D., over 300 years after Jesus ascended to heaven, that Christmas celebrations were first recorded according to Christianity.com. And Encyclopedia Britannica adds to this, One widespread explanation of the origin of this date is that December 25th was the Christianizing of De Solis Invicti Nati, Day of the Birth of the Unconquered Sun, a popular holiday in the Roman Empire that celebrated the winter solstice as a symbol of the resurgence of the sun deified as Sol Invictus, the casting away of winter and the heralding of the rebirth of spring and summer. And the New World Encyclopedia also points out, yet from the first, identification of Christ's birth with a pagan holiday was controversial. The theologian Origen, writing in 245 CE, denounced the idea of celebrating the birthday of Jesus as if he were a king pharaoh. Thus Christmas was celebrated with a mixture of Christian and secular customs from the beginning, and remains so to this day. Furthermore, in the opinion of many theologians, there was little basis for celebrating Christ's birth in December. As we saw plainly during our tabernacle celebration this year, the Gospel of Luke gives us many clues that prove that Jesus was most likely born in late September. So, not only is Christmas not biblical, its timing and its traditions are firmly rooted in worldly and overtly pagan idolatry, and Christmas has been rejected by many conscientious Christians since it was first recorded as being celebrated in Rome in 336 BC. Truly, anyone who has tested Christmas against the Holy Scriptures as Paul instructed was able to see that it was clearly a foul human addition to God's Word. Stephen Nissenbaum, Professor Emeritus of the History Department of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst wrote in his book, The Battle for Christmas, the Puritans were correct when they pointed out, and they pointed it out often, that Christmas was nothing but a pagan festival covered with a Christian veneer. The Reverend Increase Mather of Boston, for example, accurately observed in 1687 that the early Christians who first observed the Nativity on December 25th, did not do so, thinking that Christ was born in that month, but because the heathen Saturnalia was at that time kept in Rome, they were willing to have those pagan holidays metamorphosed into Christian ones. But on the opposite end of the Christian spectrum from the Puritans, the New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia explains, in fact, the date of Jesus' birth was deliberately set to coincide with this pagan festival, which had degenerated over the centuries into a week-long spree of debauchery and crime. And R. L. Dabney writes in his book, Systematic Theology, 
the Lutheran communion, as ordered by Luther, Melanchthon, and their subordinate bishops, held that it was lawful and proper for church authorities to ordain days and rites not contrary to the letter or spirit of Scripture, but additional to those appointed therein. They taught that the rulers of the church might lawfully institute rites, ordinances, and holy days consonant to the word of God, though additional to those set down in it, and that they might lawfully change such ordinances from time to time as convenience and propriety required. They also teach that the Sabbath, with its strict and enforced observances, was purely a Levitical institution. So Lutherans, like many other Protestant reformers, followed in the Roman Catholic Church's footsteps by arguing that they could make up and dispose of biblical holy days at will. Obviously, it is thinking like this that has kept the pagan feast of Saturnalia alive in the Church in the form of Christmas. But Jesus said, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do, he said to them. All too well, you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. We are not permitted to lay aside the commandments of God, and we are definitely not permitted to teach the doctrine and commandments of men, or hold on to man-made traditions, or we will find ourselves worshipping Jesus Christ in vain. Because the Catholic Church, and even the Protestants, compromised with the world, History.com reports, On Christmas, believers attended church, then celebrated raucously in a drunken, carnival-like atmosphere similar to today's Mardi Gras. Each year, a beggar or student would be crowned the Lord of Misrule, and eager celebrants played the part of his subjects, the poor would go into the houses of the rich and demand their best food and drink, and if owners failed to comply, their visitors would most likely terrorize them with mischief. And a few simple hours of research will provide plenty of documentation that backs up this quote of Charles Spurgeon who said, Upright men strove to stem the tide, but in spite of all of their efforts, the apostasy went on till the church, with the exception of a small remnant, was submerged under pagan superstition. That Christmas is a pagan festival is beyond all doubt. The time of the year and the ceremonies with which it is celebrated prove its origin. But those who follow the custom of observing Christmas follow not the Bible, but pagan ceremonies. History.com explains about the seemingly innocent Christmas tree. Long before the advent of Christianity, plants and trees that remained green all year had a special meaning for people in the winter. Just as people today decorate their homes during the festive season with pine, spruce, and fir trees, ancient peoples hung evergreen boughs over their doors and windows. In many countries it was believed that evergreens would keep away witches, ghosts, evil spirits, and illness. And they also mentioned early Romans marked the solstice with a feast called the Saturnalia in honor of Saturn, the god of agriculture. The Romans knew that the solstice meant that soon farms and orchards would be green and fruitful. To mark the occasion, they decorated their homes and temples with evergreen boughs. In northern Europe, the mysterious Druids, the priests of the ancient Celts, also decorated their temples with evergreen boughs as a symbol of everlasting life. And because of this, they add, as late as the 1840s, 
Christmas trees were seen as pagan symbols and not accepted by most Americans. Truly, with a little research, you will find that the winter solstice celebrations like Christmas are pagan. December the 25th is pagan. Evergreen decorations are pagan. Bringing evergreen trees into the home is pagan. Yule logs and yuletide greetings are pagan. Giving gifts to one another at the time of the winter solstice is pagan. Mistletoe is pagan. Stockings are pagan. Christmas lights are pagan. And of course, Santa is the pagan god Odin reinvented for the West. Clearly, every aspect of Christmas in late December came into being from paganism. And Christmas is therefore an idolatrous form of spiritual adultery that is kept alive by tradition instead of sound doctrine. Christmas is of the world, and if we knowingly embrace the things of this world, we will make ourselves an enemy of God. Jesus not only didn't allow his church to compromise with pagan rituals, in his law he commanded that we destroy all forms of pagan idolatry from our lives and never ever worship him with those tainted things. In closing, when we consider the pagan origins of Christmas, we should remember the words of Paul who said, What fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, Come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God.